So now that we have a general idea of what the electron transport chain actually does, let's discuss the details of what happens in the complexes of the electron transport chain. And so we're going to begin our discussion by examining the details of what happens in complex one and complex two. So remember that these complexes are found in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So this is complex one, this is the inner membrane of the mitochondria, this is the matrix of the mitochondria, and this is the intermembrane space. Now complex one is a very large complex. It's an L-shaped multi-subunit that contains about 46 individual polypeptide chains. So complex one is a very massive complex. Now, complex one is also known as NADH dehydrogenase or NADH oxidoreductase. And the reason we call it this is because this is the complex of the electron transport chain that ultimately accepts the high energy electrons from NADH molecules that we generate in processes such as the citric acid cycle and glycolysis. So, this L-shaped structure contains the horizontal component that lies in the membrane of the mitochondria, the inner membrane, and we have a vertical component that extends into the matrix of the mitochondria. And the NADH actually binds onto this extension that lies in the matrix of the mitochondria. And along with the NADH, an H plus ion is also actually used. And we'll see why that H plus ion is needed in just a moment. And so in the process, we ultimately oxidize the NADH back into NAD+, and those two electrons are extracted by a group known as FMN, and the FMN stands for flavin mononucleotide. So within this vertical component of complex one, we have flavin mononucleotide, which accepts those two high energy electrons from the NADH molecule. Now, if we take a look at the structure of FMN, this is what it's going to look like in its fully oxidized form. So oxidized basically means before it accepted those electrons. So we have this R component that contains a phosphate group not shown here, and we have this three ring structure. And this three ring structure, so one, two, three, is known as the isoloxazine ring. And the isoloxazine ring in this flavin mononucleotide is the same exact isoloxazine ring that is found in FAD molecules. Remember, FAD stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide, and we find FAD in the citric acid cycle. And the FAD is able to extract those two electrons in the same exact way that FMN is able to use this same isoloxazine ring to actually extract those two electrons. But the two electrons cannot actually bind onto the FMN by themselves. They need two H plus ions. So we have two H plus ions and two electrons, one H atom basically binds onto this nitrogen and the other H atom binds onto this nitrogen. And we form the reduced form of flavin mononucleotide known as FMNH2. And that's why we need an additional H ion. So one H ion comes, here, uh, uh, comes from here, the other H ion comes from here, and the two electrons are found on the NADH, and we ultimately oxidize the NADH into NAD+, and we form the FMNH2. And this takes place on the matrix side of this complex one. So once again, the NADH molecule donates the two electrons onto an acceptor group found on the vertical component of complex one known as flavin mononucleotide FMN. The FMN is reduced into FMNH2, and this prosthetic group contains the same isoaloxazine ring that we find on the FAD molecule. So the FAD is similar to FMN in the sense that they contain this same three member ring that is used to actually form that or actually used to extract and collect those electrons.
Now, once we reform the NAD+, that NAD+, can be reused by the process of the citric acid cycle or glycolysis, where the NAD+, molecules are needed to actually oxidize the glucose derivative and abstract those electrons. But what happens to the electrons once they are abstracted by FMN? Well, once the electrons are abstracted by FMN, those electrons begin to move along a series of other groups known as iron sulfur clusters, iron sulfur groups. And as these electrons actually move along these different groups, we know from basic physics that whenever electrons flow along a certain area, that flow of electrons is what we call an electric current. And that electric current can be used to power some type of process. And in this particular case, the process that we power is the pumping of H plus ions. So what we want to do is we want to establish a proton electrochemical gradient that will ultimately be used by ATP synthase to form ATP molecules. And so protein complex one is actually a proton pump. And as these electrons move and ultimately end up on ubiquinone, as we'll see in just a moment, four H plus ions are actually pumped by protein complex one from the matrix side to the intramembrane space of the mitochondrion. Now, as these electrons move, they ultimately end up on a carrier molecule known as coenzyme Q or ubiquinone. Now, ubiquinone accepts two electrons and it also actually accepts two H plus ions. So it takes up two H plus ions from the matrix and it forms the fully reduced form of ubiquinone, QH2, which is known as ubiquinol. So once again, the electrons, once they abstracted by flavin mononucleotide, then move along a series of iron sulfur groups shown here and are ultimately transferred to coenzyme Q ubiquinone. The ubiquinone also, uh, also uptakes to protons and that helps us establish that electrochemical gradient and those two H ions bind onto Q to basically form the reduced form of uh, uh, ubiquinone known as ubiquinone. And as these electrons move along this proton complex, it pumps four H plus ions from the matrix side onto the intramembrane side. Now, let's move on to complex two. Now, complex two is actually not a proton pump. So that's the main difference between complex one, three, and four, and complex two. Complex two is not a proton pump. It will not pump any protons across the membrane. And actually, because of that, less ATP molecules will be formed from FADH2 than from NADH. Now, the reason we mention FADH2 is because complex one is actually, uh, complex two is actually responsible for extracting those electrons from FADH2 molecules. Now, let's think back to the citric acid cycle. In the citric acid cycle, the step that allowed us to form the FADH2 molecule is this step here. In this step, uh, succinate is oxidized into fumarate and the FAD molecule is reduced into FADH2. So these two H atoms along with one electron each are extracted, they bind onto FAD to form the FADH2. And these two electrons left over here, one here and one here, create a double bond to form this fumarate molecule. And the enzyme that catalyzes this step of the citric acid cycle is known as succinate dehydrogenase. And actually, succinate dehydrogenase, the enzyme that catalyzes this step of the citric uh, acid cycle, is found within complex two. So complex two is actually involved in the citric acid cycle in forming the FADH2 molecule and extracting those electrons from succinate to form fumarate. Now, complex two, for that reason, is also known as succinate reductase because we essentially abstract those electrons from succinate, we oxidize it into fumarate, and we reduce the FAD into FADH2. Now, once we form the FADH2, the FADH2 remains bound 
to complex two. And in complex two, the two electrons are abstracted from FADH2 and they move on to series of iron sulfur clusters, iron sulfur groups, and ultimately those two electrons end up being bound to ubiquinone coenzyme Q, the same coenzyme Q that we discussed in this particular case. And again, the coenzyme Q, once it binds those two electrons, it abstracts two H plus ions to form ubiquinone. The ubiquinone then departs. It detaches from the complex and moves on to complex three. So once we form ubiquinone here, and once we form ubiquinone here, they detach and move on onto complex three, as we'll see in the next lecture. So to summarize, Complex II, also known as succinate reductase, is a protein complex that contains succinate dehydrogenase, which functions in the citric acid cycle. So complex II actually converts succinate into fumarate and generates that FADH2 molecule. And the FADH2 molecule doesn't actually detach, it remains attached onto complex II. So this is complex II. The FADH2 is uh, uh, remains bound onto the complex and then it basically is oxidized back into FAD. It basically kicks off those two H ions, uh, to, uh, those two H, um, yeah, the two H ions as well as those two electrons. And those two electrons then travel through a series of these iron sulfur clusters and ultimately end up being bound onto that coenzyme Q, the ubiquinone. When the ubiquinone uptakes those two H ions, it then forms ubiquinone, which detaches and moves on to complex three, as we'll see in, in the next lecture. And again, a very important distinction between complex one and complex two is the fact that complex one actually pumps those protons and helps generate that electrochemical gradient for hydrogen ions, but this one doesn't actually pump any protons. And that's precisely why, as we'll see in a future lecture, NADH is able to actually form a greater number of ATP molecules compared to the FADH2. So the complex oxidizes succinate into fumarate in the process forming the FADH2, which is then oxidized back into FAD, and that release the two electrons, which ultimately move through these FES uh, clusters and onto ubiquinone to then form ubiquinone. And the ubiquinone is the electron carrier that shuttles these electrons from either complex one or two onto complex three of the electron transport chain.